So, my family, when I say my family, that includes my husband's family, um, went through quite a week this week. Last week I was ministering um, over at I, um, I Celebrate, and uh, yeah, their pipes have been froze, so pray for them. That seems to happen, I guess, every winter they go through that, so it's a little bit of a work, but you still meet together and you get through it. But we were over there ministering to them. Pastor David asked me to come and minister, so that was an honor, and it was a blessing, but my heart was here. I was like, God, I'm really praying for Jordan Rivers. I'm like, it's just weird not to be here, so I feel like I haven't been in church in a month. Mm -hmm. That's how it feels. Yeah. Because it was a week there, and then we hadn't had Wednesdays in two weeks. And so my Marlene and I were talking, it did, it just felt weird. Mm -hmm. And we were like, it feels like we haven't been in church in a month. It's not true, but it just felt like that, you know? So this week, and this week we felt like we lived a year in a week. <laughs> it was yeah. that kind of a week, and it was like, oh. So last Friday is kind of where it began for me. We um, had a meeting, and... I got called before the meeting that my husband's aunt was being put in hospice. And by the time we got out of the meeting, we were being called that she had already gone home. It was that fast. And she had been sick for a while, so we knew some things were coming uh, coming anyway. And she was older, and she had her grandkids and all of that stuff. But still, was very difficult because it was a closing door for his family. It was their mom's last sibling that was living. <coughs> And it was the last aunt. And so there's just this feeling of like finality. finality to it. And where the boys have been orphans in the, in the sense of both of their parents being gone, now all the aunts and uncles. So it was just such a finality. And um, so the, he the weekend was heavy. And we went in praying, believing for healing. Healing comes, but healing always comes differently. Sometimes it's on this earth, and sometimes it's in glory. Mm -hmm. And we know that. Our family's been through it before with my grandmother and different things. And my husband's family's been through it with their parents and now with the aunt. And so we had double the funerals. Matt and I left to go to Flint on Thursday morning and um, go to that home going for his aunt and... His brother came up from, both of his brothers from Joplin, Missouri, came in to, and his cousin from there, to, uh, he, into the snowstorm. Oh so we drove through the snowstorm, got down there, went through all of that. But before all that came on Thursday, my family went through um, Tasha stepping into Jesus' arms. And Tuesday morning, when everything happened Monday night, I fell asleep finally about a half hour after my mom called me and went to bed, got up Tuesday morning and my heart was heavy. And that was the song I heard, just the line, I have this hope in yep. the depth of my soul. But I didn't hear in the flood of the fire what I heard the Spirit of God sing is in life or in death. You're with me and you don't let go. And I sat down before tea with me because I was up getting my notes ready and finish everything. And I had two other sermons planned for this Sunday. I was picky and I didn't know which one I was going to do. And this is what God sent me to. So Hebrews chapter 6, if you want to turn there, verse 19. He said, nope, you're going to talk on this. <laughs> and I went, oh, okay. This hope we have is an anchor of the soul. <laughs> Both sure and steadfast, which, which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us. Oh, yeah. I don't know, but you know, you can read these words and they just seem blah. But you can read these words in a moment and they're Raymond, and they jump off the page and slap you in the head. You know? Or they squeeze your heart right when you needed a hug. Right when you needed God to say, I gotcha. Hmm, that's good. 
even Jesus having become our high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the Amplified, <coughs> same set of scripture says, Now we have this hope as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. It cannot slip, it cannot break down under whoever steps upon it. It's a hope. Mm, yeah that reaches farther and enters into the very cer cer certainty of the presence within the veil, where Jesus has entered into it for us in advance, a forerunner, having become a high priest forever after the order of the rank of Mikhail's deck. It cannot break. It cannot slip. We cannot fall. We can't step off of it or down into it. It's a hope. It's a solid rock. Oh, yeah. It's That's firm. Yeah. There we have this hope. See, hope is a funny thing. Because if you don't have hope, you don't have faith. It's a birth seat of faith. Mm -hmm. And if you lose your hope, your faith, you, there's no faith. Because yeah. faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So hope is always the seed, mm -hmm. and faith is the evidence of your hope. People say, well, I have faith. No, do you have hope? Because hope is first. I have this hope in the depths of my soul. Yes. And see, if it's in deep in your soul, no one can remove it from you. Yeah. You can yeah. persecute me. You can make fun of me. Yeah. You can go and write things and try to change laws, try to change the way our society, all sorts of things. But that hope is so deep in my soul, you don't get to get it out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Nobody gets to change it because it's in my soul. Yeah. You can behead me and you still can't take out my hope because it's not in my head. That's right. That's right. It's in my soul. It's deep, buried inside of me where no one can get it. It's anchored. You know, we were blessed to be able to have a boat during the summer. <coughs> We can't go on vacation and be away for a long, any length of time because of John that we take care of. And so our family decided instead of vacationing and spending a lot of money on a vacation that you do one time mm -hmm. and have a few memories, we were going to do something, put the money towards it, and have something we can have many memories many different times for many years. And it was a decision that we made, prayed over, this was our heart. Yeah. That means nothing against anyone. That was just where we were at. But that's our life. And so we made that decision. So we were out there. And I found out how good anchors and what they're really for. Amen. <laughs> that's right. There's a purpose of an anchor. So we had stopped and we had gotten closer to the shore and we were letting the kids kind of get off and swim. And we decided since we were going to spend so much time on this and this was our vacation, my husband got this little tiny grill and like screwed it into the boat so it's there and everybody's like oh my gosh you have a grill and I'm like yes we're just having a blast yeah. so we're out there doing some hot dogs and the kids were swimming and stuff but we hadn't anchored it very well so as the other boats were coming in and stuff we're like getting further and further and the kids are getting closer to shore and we're like uh, we have a problem <laughs> so you know you pull up that anchor and we're like okay we didn't anchor that well and that's when I found out your anchor is important it, it serves a purpose. Yes. Yes. There is a purpose for it. And it's not just something to look pretty. Mm -hmm. But there's a purpose for it. And it, it also matters where you anchor it to. Because if you anchor it in the sand, it doesn't work very well. No. You really want to anchor it where there's a little bit of clay or something that has some, uh, what do you, would gusto, something that has little guts, you know? Because if you just anchor it in sand, you're going to do what we did and start floating away from everybody. So it happens, especially when a few boats come by and they send their wake and it smacks you. And it, was, it did. It smacked the boat and we're all, okay, really that's uncomfortable. So we found out anchors have a purpose. We found out anchors were so important, we got two. <laughs> because if you only get one and anchor the front, the back is still... So we found two was a good thing. So I found out, you know, I think this actually made more sense to me now. I'm like, now that I've actually done this once, this makes more sense. 
Anchors are important. Because life is going to throw you for curves all the time. It's going to hit you wave after wave sometimes. Yeah. This week was a wave after wave. It was like, wham. Yeah. <laughs> and just as you start to get your footing, mm -hmm. it smacks you again. And you're like, seriously, will you knock it off? Yeah. Yeah. And you just get your footing and then wham again. <laughs> and it was like, mm -hmm. if you don't have an anchor, you won't withstand the wave. Mm -hmm. When we were in California in 2004 with our teenagers, <clears throat> we had no intention of swimming, but we wanted them to see the ocean. Sorry, I have got stuff on my glasses, and it's hard to see. So, you go, you know, you come all, you fly all the way over from Michigan. We only had a couple days of really fun stuff because then they had to compete. That's why we were there. So they were there for their competitions, and we got one day to just go run and do stuff. So we drove miles. We were in Anaheim, California. So we drove miles to get to the ocean because it's not right there. So we drove out, got to the ocean, and it was June and it wasn't pretty. It's kind of overcast. It wasn't raining, but it was windy. It really wasn't that warm. We thought, I think it's warmer in Michigan right now. <laughs> we got to the ocean and it was not warm. It was cold. It wasn't like when I went to Florida and it was like bath water. This is not what it was like. And we all just, everybody wanted to just put their feet in, so they rolled up because nobody came with their swimsuits. We did not come prepared. Okay? So we rolled up our pant legs, and we're just out there kind of waiting. Well, then we found out, mm, waves, ocean, you, not in your bathing suit. It's not smart. Because those waves are going to knock you over. And needless to say, we were all soaking wet when we were done. All of us. And eventually the girls just looked at us and said, swimsuits or not, we're going to go jump waves. So, everybody got wet. Anyway, but I found out it's very difficult to stand there when a wave is coming at you. You have to plant your feet. You have to do this thing where you put your feet way in the dirt. And the whole time I'm doing this, because we're, we're doing it, we're trying to you know, anchor ourselves. The whole time I'm thinking, I hope there's no creatures down there. <laughs> And I, again, my feet were the anchor, but I just kept thinking of anchors this week. This was what was hitting my heart. So I'm sitting there Tuesday morning, and God says I'm your anchor. If you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It's not easy when we face tragedy to find hope. But let me tell you something, the word has hope in it. And Paul talks about a blessed hope. We have a blessed hope. We have a hope of resurrection. We have an assurance. We sing blessed assurance. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. I'm an heir of salvation. Purchased by God. Born of his spirit, and I've been washed in his blood. That was my mother in law song. I had to sing it at her funeral. Mm -hmm. Blessed assurance. So we know if you start at verse 1 in chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, everybody kind of patch your dress for a minute. This is your tent. This house. Hold on a second for a minute. The greatest revelation I ever had in worship was every time we sing a worship song and the word earth is mentioned, it's talking about you. Because you are earth. So every time we would sing things about earth, I always caught that. God, you're talking about me. That one's for me. So this earthly house, this tent, is destroyed. We have a building from God, a house made, not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan and we earnestly desire, desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we, ha we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now we have prepared, he has prepared for us this very thing, 
is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident knowing that while we were at home in the body, we are when we, while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, that rather to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Mm -hmm. We groan and we mourn and we grieve during this life. We go through pain, we go through sorrow, and we go through loss. But one day we have this hope yes. in the depths of our soul mm -hmm. that when we're absent from this body, we're present with the Lord. Mm -hmm. Earth is temporal. And when you face death in a situation where someone passes away, to this week was one of those mirrors that I got to see where we had someone pass away and everybody kind of knew it was coming. She lived her life. She had all the days. She had the grandbabies. And they were there and they were talking. And there were older gentlemen that got up and told stories about their grandma, made us laugh hysterically. The one, the one grandson got up and he said, just, you know, I'm the pretty grandson. <laughs> and he was, he was a nice looking guy and I was kind of laughing because I know his aunts. I don't, didn't know him. And so I was just meeting them. I think the first time I ever met them, they were really little. So he was talking about him being the, the, the cool looking one. His other, um, the other grandson got up and he said, well, he might be the good looking one, but I'm the, well, I'm the, the favored one. He goes, because Grandma had four pictures above her bed. Three were Jesus, and the other one was me. <laughs> so I found, I found in a life lived and in a legacy like hers, and she had lived for the Lord. She raised her kids to love God, and there was so much joy. And then we dealt with so much tragedy and a life cut short. Yet it was lived and lived to its fullest. It didn't feel fair. And it made us question a lot of things. And see, death often when it comes into a family, into our lives, through a friendship, it makes us question ourselves. It's meant to. It's meant to make us question our own mortality, our own death, our own legacy, the, the things, you know, you, you sit at a funeral and you think, what would people say about me? Mm. It makes you question those things because that's what it does. Solomon said life is a fleeting vapor. So did James. Solomon got to a point after living so many years and going through so many things, he got a bit of an attitude and said, it's just all vanity anyway. He did. He just, you know, if it ain't about God, it's all vanity anyway. Earth is temporal. But there are eternal things. And then when you face death, when you bury someone, when you go through all of those things, you face those questions of what's really eternal and what really matters. <clears throat> we all go through storms and trials in life. And often in these times we ask why. And you know, yesterday at Tasha's funeral, um, her uncle, which is Will Markham, and Will Markham is, he was a pat he's been a pastor my whole life and I've known Will for a very long time. I grew up with his kids. In fact, when his boys saw me come through the door, they're like, Chasta. And so I was hugging him, and one of his son's names is Benjamin. Mm -hmm. So I was telling him, you want to go see Ben? <laughs> it was kind of, so, because he forgot that I had written one of my sons that name. So we were talking about it. And um, I was very thankful for Will, because it's not an easy thing to do a funeral of a young person. That's a different kind of... My, my brother-in-law did the funeral for Matt's aunt, and it was a different type of atmosphere because she was older. And so Will was very cautious and careful, but he was generous with his words. And he talked about why, which I was sitting there, I kept tapping Matt on the knee going, he's preaching my sermon. <laughs> that I wrote Tuesday morning in the middle of everything. 
And I said, that's so funny, because he was talking about the why questions. And I was sitting there going, okay. So obviously this is where God was on that moment. Mm -hmm. We often ask why. Mm -hmm. Why? You know, Job asked why. He lost all of his kids mm -hmm. in a day. Yeah. Now, we sometimes compare ourselves to Job. And after reading that and really studying that, I can't. I can't compare myself to Job, because I've never lost all my children in a day. I've never lost all of my goods in a day. I've never lost everything in a day. And people get down on the wife for being a crab. But the woman was grieving. Of course she was being mouthy. You know, when you grieve, you can grieve in bitterness or you can grieve in hope. You really can. The grief will become unbearable if you do it out of bitterness. It will be something that will swallow you and take your life. And you won't live anymore because you can't live from bitter. You can't. In fact, it will rot your bones. Mm -hmm. Or we can grieve from, and I was talking to somebody else at the funeral, and it was interesting because we talked about grief at the women's night out back in December. And that was a hard mm -hmm. session, and probably the hardest one I've ever done, mm -hmm. to talk about that grief doesn't get better, just different. But you can't quit living because God doesn't want you to lose your hope in that. Don't, don't give up. Can you question and ask why? Mm -hmm. But go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 if you're still in the Corinthians there. Because you can ask why. Listen, Job asked why. He did. What you don't want to do is start putting words in God's mouth. Because then you're going to have a moment like his friends did where God showed up and rebuked them all. Mm -hmm. Or when God showed up and had to rebuke Job because he got to a place where he decided he knew God and God's reasonings. Mm -hmm. There's a point where you have to go, God, why? And then you have to sit back and you have to trust his sovereignty. Yes, yes, amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 9 says this, For we know in part... And we prophesy in part. Mm -hmm. This is probably, because I kept asking God why. I said, God, why? What is going on? Lord, I know your word. I know your promises. We, you know, we know what works. We do. I said, why? And he took me to the scripture. For you only know in part. You only see in part. Jesus is on one side of the veil and we're on the other, and we see through only what we, he lets us see. And we only know in part. We think we know it all. We're really good about thinking we have all the answers. Mm -hmm. I used to be afraid of if somebody came and asked me a question of saying, I don't know. I'm so not afraid of that anymore. I look at people sometimes and just say, ask God, because I'm not him. Sometimes the answer, sometimes the answer is this. Do you trust me? <laughs> really, God? And, and look, if you want to talk about the queen of why, it's me. I know it. Because I'm the woman who would stand out in a field and scream at God, What are you doing? <laughs> That's me. There's nothing wrong with asking why, but when God answers, what if his answer is, do you trust me? What if his answer is, you don't see it yet, but one day you'll understand? Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's an old song, you'll understand it better by and by. Mm -hmm. By and by, when the morning comes. Right? Mm -hmm. We'll understand it later. Yeah. When we're on the other side of the veil, things will be revealed that we don't grasp right now. Yeah. We think of our lives... And eternity seems so weird of a concept. I'm trying to explain eternity to my kids. And you try to explain it with a rope and show your life this big and then eternity just keeps going on. And the rope still has a beginning and end, so that doesn't work. The only way you can kind of figure it out is if you loop the rope so that it, oh, it never ends, so that it's round. I mean, that's what rings were about. They were meant to be an eternal sign. About the closest thing you can figure out. The figure eight, same thing, it's an eternity sign. So that makes probably the closest sense. 
But our brains are so finite and God is so infinite. And you just can't, if you think you're going to understand God with your little tiny brain, yeah. are you kidding me? The God of the universe who made everything and we're an ant and yet he saves your tears? That just blows my mind. And he blows my concepts. There is no box for God. You can't fit him in this little concept. So if you're going to think you're going to understand life, death, anything in this life and really grasp it, you got another thing coming. Because this is not the way it goes. And sometimes the question is, hmm, I guess why, but here's the answer. God's on a throne, and I'm not. It's his choice. He knows. He knows things I don't know. And so we see in part. We prophesy in part. We simply don't always understand the answers. See, Job and his friend, the problem that they got into is that they tried to come up with an answer for all of God's reasonings. And you can't do that because it's we can't really think inside of God's brain. We just can't. We don't we don't match. The tough questions, well why? Why me? Why not me? Why am I going through this? So I learned this week, trust God in his sovereignty. Not ourselves or our own wisdom. You guys, we can question the medical doctors. We can question till the cows come home how things come. I'm not saying there isn't reasons. I'm not saying that God can't show us something. He can show us, hey, this is a seed that was planted or this came and this started to grow, so that became part of it. We don't always know the reasons for everything. He doesn't always tell us all of it. When my husband got hit... First thing I said, when my dad called me and said Matt got crushed, did he get burned? Because a few weeks before, he had had one spark go through layers of fire retardant clothing and it had burnt him. And I knew if that ladle was full and it hit him and it splashed it all, he was gone. And that was the first thing I said is, did it burn him? No, he said, miraculously, none of it spilled on him. But he got crushed, pressed into the guardrail. So I'm in the car. I'm driving to the ambulance, or driving to the hospital. My foster daughter was with me, and she's sitting next to me. And, and we were coming right here by the church, and I'm praying in the spirit and trying to drive. And this deer comes out. I mean, this is all happening at once. This deer comes out, and I'm thinking, okay, so I slowed down, waiting for it to cross the road, but it decided to jog next to us. Oh. For a whole mile. And Mindy has got the window down and she's talking to it. She's like, leave. Go away. We don't want to hit you. And I'm driving really slow. So that slowed me down. Finally, the deer just goes off. I'm like, I don't know what that deer was doing, why it was curious. I don't know if maybe God was trying to slow me down because there was something else coming. I could have gotten an accident. I don't know. One day I might find that out. He might go into that, you know that deer that slowed you down that day you needed to get to the hospital real quick? It was because of this, this, and this. We see in part, we only know in part. And we were kind of like, what was that? I don't know, but God does. There are moments when you go through something. When we went down state for Flint, and they don't sand down there. They scrape the roads and everything's just solid ice. <laughs> So every ramp we got off was just solid ice. So we went to get off this one ramp because Matt's like, I need coffee to wake up. I am just like, literally I'm dragging. And we had been up, we had literally left at five in the morning. So we'd been up since four and we were really exhausted. It was already 10 o'clock. And so we pulled off this ramp and I don't know, it was just weird. Um, we got lost somewhere. We had to pull back around and we ended up back and ended up go, having to go back around to come into this one spot and there had been an accident. 
and we missed it. Had we not gotten off that weird ramp, we would have been probably in it. So that was, that was interesting. And I just kind of sat back and went, Lord, even our detours can be ordered by him. Yes. So we got, man, like I got to get something to eat. So we got some coffee. He went, to, he actually decided instead of coffee, he just got an iced tea. And the lady handed it to him. The lid wasn't on and the whole thing dropped in his lap. He looks at me and goes, I'm not going to the funeral wet. I said, well, you know what's amazing? We left early, so we're good. We have time. Let's run to Walmart. Let's find a Walmart. So we asked the lady. She's like, oh, yeah, two door rolls down this way. It wasn't where she said it was. <laughs> so thank God for Google Maps because we're Googling it and we're finding it, whatever. We end up through going through one intersection, almost hitting a car, almost hitting a bankment. And we get to Walmart, and I'm like, Matt, go get some clothes. So he goes in there and gets some clothes. I'm just sitting there going, God, even in the detour, I don't know what you're doing, but I'm trusting you yes. that you got this. And we still got there in plenty of time. <laughs> so I know God still was directing us, and he was still leading us mm -hmm. through the crazy <laughs> day we had. We don't see it all. No. We don't. We don't know. When he got hit, I asked God over and over and over, why? We've already been through enough. Lord, do I have to remind you huh? what we've been through? Do I have to give you the list? Sorry, this is, me and God have a weird relationship, okay? Some people are like, oh, you're not very reverent with him. I'm like, he's my dad. He made me, he knows my snarky, and he takes it. I mean, he does. Yep. And he dishes it back, too. <laughs> he does. And I take it, because it's just our personality, so I get it. You have your own relationship with God, everybody does. You know, if you if that's where you're at, and you love God, and you, have, you talk to him like a father, I'm sure you have your moments, too. But I was like, God, why? Why are we going through this? We've been through enough. And the Lord over and over in those five years would remind me, I'm going to use this. So yesterday when we walked in, we had put stuff online, but it's not like I wrote everybody and told them about my husband's miracle. I didn't. So we walked in yesterday and a few of our relatives who, I think because we had switched Facebook accounts or whatever, they haven't, we haven't been connected at all. We just haven't been. And they certainly didn't see his miracle, didn't know. They walked right up to Matt and went, where's your cane? Mm -hmm. How are you walking? Because mm -hmm. the last time they'd seen him, he's, you know, driving his life. So he, he showed them the miracle online and sent it to them so they can look at it. Yeah. But it was one of those, and I thought, Lord, he told me, one of the th things he told me probably about a year before Matt got healed, I'm going to use this mm -hmm. because now everybody will know. Yes. Yeah. It isn't something a doctor did. It isn't. But I remember four years, not even four years, not four years in, four months in, and I was done. I wanted out of this moment in my life. I wanted out of that season. Yeah. I mean, I remember many times Matt just saying, I don't understand why God just won't heal me. This is ridiculous. Especially when they're laying there shocking him and doing all sorts of stuff. And he's a guinea pig. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know? He's done. Mm -hmm. But we don't always know the end. We don't always see from where we're at in yeah. the middle of something to see how God is going to be glorified when he does something. Yes. Amen. And sometimes the answer isn't... Thank God for doctors, but sometimes the answer isn't from a doctor or from a medicine. It comes simply from Him. Amen. Amen. And I'll tell you, in the middle of this, and I remember people kept telling Matt to go try different meds and different things and different ways of healing. I mean, I'm telling you, it came out of the woodwork at him. And he held his ground. He had anchored his soul in the fact that the only person I know he, who can heal me is Jesus. Mm -hmm. I know it. And he anchored himself in that. He tried a couple things and realized real quick, that's not God. <laughs> I never touched it, ever. 
because he knew. No, if Jesus doesn't do this, I don't care. It's, it's by him and him alone. I'm done. And he, I mean, he had frustrated people. We walk into a church. We visited a church. And the lady came up to him and said, well, you need to take me this, this oil, and you need to be smoking this, and you need to be doing that. And so somebody really chewed me out one day about him not doing something about the, the pain he was in. And I went to him and I said, I'm not going to tell you what to do. What do you want to do? But I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, Jasa, here's the problem. If I do this, everybody knows, including my kids, who right now I'm an example to. And if I get involved in this stuff, I'm okaying it for them for whatever purpose they want to. Yeah. He goes, and I have kids that are already running off and doing their own thing. They know better, but they're adults, and they've got to make their choices with the Lord. Yeah. He said, but I'm not going to give them an excuse. Yeah. And he stood so firm in that anchor in his soul that I'm not going to compromise. Yet we had no reason. We had no answer. And we kept asking why, and the answer was, trust me. So sometimes God doesn't answer the way you want. He says, are you just going to trust me? Are you going to trust my sovereignty? You know, somebody in the Bible didn't trust God's sovereignty, so he tried to do it his own way, and it was Judas. Yeah, how'd that work? Let's talk about Judas for a minute. Judas was a rebel. Judas was a zealot. You know what that was? It's a specific order that really wanted to overthrow the Roman government. And they were very against being under Roman rule, which I understand. But when Jesus came into the picture, the idea of the Messiah to them was a bread king. The idea of a picture of a Messiah was a savior to overthrow the Romans and not set up God's kingdom, but Jewish rule. Okay? Really had nothing to do with God. It had to do with them being, they, they, were, they wanted freedom. Okay? So it was a noble purpose. But it wasn't God's timing. There's where God's sovereignty comes in. Sometimes the reasons that we're, we want and we want God to answer something, it's noble. But you have to remember God is sovereign. He sits on a throne. He knows timing that we don't know. Jesus didn't come to set them free in the physical. He came to set them free in the spiritual. Because here's the problem. If, I, if he set them free in the physical... And they weren't free in the spiritual. The physical really wasn't going to help the spiritual at all. Because Israel had a problem following God. You understand that? They had a real problem with it. So Jesus knew, I have to deal with the spiritual first. God had to get this covenant through so that he could write their, his law on their heart. Because he tried to write the law on the stone and it didn't work. Now he had to write his law on their heart. That comes through a rebirth. So Jesus had to come and do things spiritually so he could fix the physical. He had to go one to the other. But Judas was so upset that Jesus wasn't the guy to do it his way that Judas was willing to betray him. He was willing to rebel to try to get Jesus to do it his way. You know what's funny in his rebellion? The Lord said this to me this week. His rebellion still played out to God's plan. <coughs> Did you know God can use a rebellious kid? He can still use their rebellion. That blew my mind. Because sometimes we look at a situation and say, but God, they're rebellious, or God, they're... They're doing this wrong. Yeah, well, God could still use Judas. Mm -hmm. He did to serve a purpose. Mm -hmm. And we think of Judas, we think, yeah, but he killed himself and he didn't repent. That was his choice. Mm -hmm. But God still used him to serve the purpose that God needed Christ to be at the cross mm -hmm. to give us redemption. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in the middle of something, we want our way. 
And God's going, whose way? Yeah. I mean, look at Jesus' words in the garden. Your will be done, not mine. Those are powerful words in the middle of your storm, in the middle of anything, to say, God, it's your will, not mine. You know what I don't know. We only see in part, and he sees the big picture. He sees it. He knows. Remaining faithful and obedient is better than sacrifice. In the middle of what you're going through, it is more important that you remain obedient, faithful, than it is that you just go to your own thing and think, well, yeah. Obedience and faithful is, being faithful and obedient is priceless. In fact, I'll, I'll tell you right now, we don't teach enough on faithfulness. We don't. Because a lot of people, what takes them out, I know we get weary in storms. I know we get weary in hard times, you guys. But listen, faithfulness is key. Staying faithful in those times is the key of, number one, maturity. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Number two, endurance. Yeah. That produces character. Yeah. And what? What does is, what is character produce? Hope. Yes. It produces hope. You'll lose your hope if you don't stay faithful. You have to stay faithful. You have to stay on course. Be consistent. Well, I don't feel like it. Do it anyway. I didn't feel like doing anything Tuesday morning. I'm, I'm just being honest. We got up Tuesday morning, I'm thinking, God, I'm going to have two funerals this week. Are you kidding me? I can't even take this. I mean, I was just having a moment. And I was grieving, and there was all this stuff going on. And now I've got tea with me this morning. I wanted to call out tea with me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I've got 12 ladies coming in. God, do I really have to? I don't feel like it this morning. Mm -hmm. Where's my faithfulness? Where's my obedience in the middle of it? And you know, instead I had to put my foot over my other foot and say, all right, Jess, let's get going. Yeah. One step at a time. Move forward. Because I'm not going to get stuck. I'm just going to stay faithful. And I watched my husband for five years play drums and stay faithful. Mm -hmm. I mean, one day he's really tired, really sore. I'm not sure I can play. I said, honey, I give it to you. It's your body. If you can't, you can't. I'm not going to push on you. But he would pick himself up and put the next step in front of him and do it again. Yeah. Out of faithfulness. And it was like, you know, oh, that was obligation. No, honey, it was faithfulness. It's Because it wasn't something he felt like doing. Maybe some days it did feel like obligation. Maybe his heart wasn't really in a place of joy, but he was still being faithful and doing it. You know the funny thing about faithfulness? You're faithful to your job because of your paycheck. You're faithful to, to your job because of this. Everybody put your hands in your tummy. We're faithful to our jobs because we don't want to starve. Oh, mm -hmm. Or have a grumbly tummy because we don't know what that means to starve, really. We have enough on us. There's no such thing as starving in our country. But we don't want to get hungry. So we stay faithful to our job even though we hate it sometimes. We fight to get to work during the snowstorm. And we struggle to fight to get to church during the snowstorm. Faithfulness is key. Obedience is key. Through anything you go through, mm -hmm. fight to get through it. Mm -hmm. Amen. Fight to get through it. Stay faithful. Stay obedient. Trust, though you don't see it. Yes. Trust, though you don't see the complete answer. Mm -hmm. And even ask God. My mom shared this before about asking, God, just give me a glimmer of hope. Just give me a piece I can hang on to. That's the kind of, I was always like, God, just give me something to grasp that I can just hang on to so that it's anchored in my soul and it, my hope doesn't die. Mm -hmm. Just something, even if it's little. And trust, though you don't see it. Can I trust, though I don't know all the answers? Can I trust God's goodness and that his love cannot fail me? Yeah. We'll understand it better by and by. 
I'll tell you, you guys, you're never going to have all the answers on this side. We just aren't. But we know God, and we have this hope yes. in the depths of our soul. Amen. In death or in life, he's with us. In the flood or the fire, he's with us. Yes. And he won't let go. Amen. That's the key. Yes. I always tell the Lord, hold me. Hold me, because if you're not hanging me, hanging on to me, good Lord, I don't have a very good grip. There's a song called I Am by David Crowder, and the first time I heard it, we were going through a real tough time, and I was in the car, and I was listening to the radio, and it talks about I am holding on to you. Yeah. And I kind of had this picture of me reaching up to God, and all of a sudden I thought, my grip ain't very good. I want to picture it the other way around. <laughs> God, you're holding on to me. Uh -huh. yeah. I am is holding on to me, yeah. not the other way around. I have this hope. Mom, I'm going to invite you up here.